Hey everybody, today I'm gonna to share with you a cutting edge piece of technology that will change the way you do photography. Just kidding. But actually today I am gonna start the first of a series of videos that will take a deep dive into the new basics of photography in the mirrorless camera age. Now by the end of this series, you'll be able to go in and purchase, if you haven't already, a new DSLR or mirrorless camera and have the confidence to go out of all those auto features and get in manual mode. Now if you follow me on my adventures, this series will also help you understand the terminology that I throw around so that as I'm demonstrating different techniques, you'll be able to try them yourself. This series will really help you improve your photography. So stick around, this one's gonna be a ton of fun. All right, who remembers shooting on the trusty Kodak FunSaver camera? Seems like a lifetime ago, right? Well, some of you may not even be old enough to remember these, but if you did shoot on these, I wanna ask a question. I wanna use it for a simple comparison. If you remember during the point and shoot days of film cameras, think about how many shots did you actually shoot in a given year? Was it dozens? I mean, this one has a roll of 24. Did you shoot hundreds of shots? Well, regardless, I bet it wasn't the same as what you shoot on this. Think about what you've got on your camera roll from the last year. It's probably hundreds, if not thousands of images, right? Well, when we got on the new camera phones with iPhones and Android, just smartphones in general, the cameras have continued to get better and better. And what it's enabled us to do is shoot digital photography with reckless abandon. And even the capacity of these have gotten bigger, so we just keep throwing more and more photos on here. We document every aspect of our lives. We document our children, our pets, events, parties. We even document the food we eat. We throw it out there on social media. So my contention though is that because of these, it's so much easier now to make the leap into a professional camera than it ever has been before. I mean, going from a point and shoot camera like this with very little experience, you're looking through this dinky little viewfinder and then suddenly you've got something like this in your hands, that was kind of a leap. And I loved when I taught photography because it was a giant leap and I'm looking so much forward to this series because it's kind of like being back in my photography classroom. I miss teaching and this is, this is absolutely just a thrill for me to be back teaching basics of photography. So I think that these phones have actually given us an inclination to be so much better as photographers. Because you know what's good? You take shots on your phone like, no, nah, I'll get back over there. I'm going to try that again. That didn't look right. You reframe and you shoot because you're learning about composition. You've probably developed way better instincts than you even think. So now if you want to make that leap to take better photos of your family, your vacations, your your pets, whatever it is that you may be wanting to take better pictures of, and you do go out and buy one of these cameras, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, then how do you really get started? Well, I have made a download called The New Basics of Photography, and I'll post the link in the description where you can download this and go through this. This will cover the whole video series that we're going through, and it's pretty extensive. It started off being about like a four page um, cheat sheet and now I don't even know how many pages it is and I may even add more to it, but it just keeps growing with information. So download that and you can follow along. Okay, for starters, what do you really need to buy? If you haven't purchased a professional or prosumer camera yet, then what do you really need? I would say if you go into your local camera store, you go into Best Buy or you go online, you start shopping, any one of the big brands, whether you have a Sony, this is a Sony A series camera. I'm actually filming right now with Nikon mirrorless cameras, the Canon Rebel, if you get into the Panasonics, all of these major brands are gonna have amazing cameras. And the great thing is, is you couldn't have waited till a better time to dive in because based on the technology from just even a couple years ago to the way they are now, they're so much more forgiving. The sensors have so much more dynamic range and so many more features that will help you get the right shot the first time or in a few tries versus the other cameras which weren't as forgiving. So if you go and get any basic camera that you can afford, they're pretty good. So as you buy your camera body, 
I would say go ahead and get the kit lens. It's probably gonna be a 24 to 70 or equivalent. Like if it's a crop sensor or DX Nikon, it'll be a, a 18 to 55 or something like that. Um, get a UV filter to protect your lens because it's easier to replace a $40 UV protector than it is a tier 400 or $600 lens. And I would say uh, you might think about getting a circular polarizer or neutral density filter. We'll talk about those a little bit more later in the series. But I'm just still like, while you're at the camera shop, um, get the best tripod you can afford. Now, I've talked about my Robus 8880 in other videos, but this is actually uh, the first Manfrotto tripod I bought. It's a 501 head, and I think I bought this in 2005, and it's still awesome. I still use this tripod. So if you get a dinky, flimsy tripod, it's just not going to last. Spend a little bit of extra money because it's gonna last, it's gonna protect your investment, and most, most of all, it's gonna protect your camera. You're gonna get better quality shots. The sturdier the tripod, the better your shots are gonna be, okay? Get a well-made camera bag or backpack. I've got links to a few of my favorite ones. I always have loved Low Pro backpacks. They have tons of different sizes, and if you're just getting started and you only have a camera and one lens, you don't need this massive backpack. You can get something really small and lightweight. I'll put some links in the description. You need an air puffer. This little Giados rocket, I'll put a, this, a link in the description too. This is great for any time you need to just take the dust off of your camera. You're gonna learn out in the field that dust is your enemy. And it likes to get on the, the lens, it likes to get on this little lens uh, uh, flange right here where you actually change lenses. You have to clean that off from time to time. Um, just get one of these and keep it in your bag. It's a handy tool and you can even chase the cat around the house with it. It's pretty fun. Kids love this. They always steal this out of my bag. Okay, the next thing is uh, a memory card. Don't leave the store without a proper memory card. If you go to Best Buy or somewhere like that, they're going to have great memory cards. And I would just say to make sure that you look at the right speed and make sure that it's going to have enough heavy lifting to keep up with your camera. The last thing you want is to have a memory card that only writes to 80 megabits per second and your camera requires 90. So make sure you got the right camera card. And then also an extra battery always helps. The last thing you want to do is be out and having a great time learning photography and then your camera die because guess what? You're out of battery and you don't have an extra. So if you can afford it, go ahead and pick up a couple, three extra batteries and keep them charged and in your bag. So the next thing on my little study guide cheat sheet is a camera prep list. This will just, I'm not gonna go through all these, but you can actually interact with it and check off the little boxes and this will help you just pack and make sure you've got everything. If you're new to photography, I would highly recommend consulting this to make sure before you leave, you have everything that you need. It's really important when you first get a new camera, go ahead and put in the time to get into the user manual. I know it's a little bit boring and it's a little bit mundane, but even if you don't read the entire manual, what I want you to do is get into the camera and go into the menu settings and familiarize yourself with the way those menus are laid out. Every single camera manufacturer is different. In fact, once you kind of get the, the flow of the way a camera manufacturer puts their information, you'll probably end up sticking with it. I know people that won't switch from Canon to Nikon just because they hate the menu system. I also know guys like myself who love the way Nikon has things arranged and would hardly dare move away from Nikon. So familiarize yourself with your menu system so that you can quickly locate all the different settings in your camera. I also have a checklist on here for prepping for yourself. Little things that you might want to remember like your clothing, the snacks that you need, your bug spray and sunscreen, footwear, make sure you charge your phone. I've also listed some really helpful apps here in this mobile download that will help you plan your location. I'll talk about these on location scouting. These are powerful apps, guys. Like Google Earth, all trails will help you find trailheads and even see photos that people have posted on things that you can see as you go around these trails. AccuWeather will help you plan for a nice window of good weather, see what kind of clouds may be on the horizon, if there's gonna be rain. Photo pills, as you become more and more advanced, I would say get photo pills early. It's just taking so much guesswork out of things like focus that I'll get into later. Learning when the moon's gonna come up and when it's gonna go down. Planning sunset shots. Photo pills is so powerful. 
And then Clear Outside is just a nice little add-on app that I love that helps you determine whether it's gonna be foggy out, um, haze, visibility. It's great for determining that in the forecast. So download these apps and they'll be helpful too. Now, before we get into how we're gonna shoot photography, go through the trouble to set up everything properly in your camera. Now, uh, I'm not gonna go through everything on there. You can read this and I'm sure you'll find it really, really helpful. But the most important thing I would say is to make sure that you're setting your camera to shoot raw. You want to make sure you've got all the data that you can get from a scene before you get back home and get on the computer and start editing. Now, JPEGs are gonna look a little bit better and more polished on first glance on the camera but they have baked in saturation and sharpening and it actually compresses the file and you lose data so at the the best thing would even be if you just don't really feel comfortable editing raw photos yet to set your camera to shoot raw plus jpeg it takes a little more space on your memory card but i would say it'd be a good move always format your memory card before a shoot i've the worst thing and every single professional has done this you get out on a shoot and you start blowing and going and shooting frames only to realize guess what you have all the photos from your last shoot that you forgot to format your card and delete so you had just a little bit of room at the at the tail end of that card and now you're out of space so now you're forced to either go through and the trouble of deleting one at a time from your previous shoot or scrapping everything you just got so just make it a practice that you do is always back up your files on your computer and format your memory card before you go out on your next outing. You don't want to be forgetting that. You'll get out to a beautiful scene and the lighting's perfect and you need to shoot. Make sure that card's formatted before you even put it in your bag. Make sure your batteries are charged before they go in the bag so you're ready when you get on location. So now you're ready to get out and start shooting photos. The number one thing that I want to talk about first today is composition because it's the part of photography that starts well before you ever put your eye up to that viewfinder. It could be one of the most enjoyable parts of the whole photography journey and it can also be one of the most challenging. But let's just take for instance that you're approaching the scene of a beautiful waterfall. You're taking in all the sights. You're enjoying the sounds, the power, you hear it. You keep moving your feet, trying to desperately get to a place where you can see it better. You come out from under the limbs and move around. Finally, you're there where you have a clear view of that waterfall. You know what you're doing in that moment? You're moving your body so that you can expose your eyes to a better composition. Have you ever wondered why around natural parks, state parks, there's these little beaten down footpaths and walkways and trails that lead to these gated off areas that are called things like scenic overlooks or points of interest. It's because those areas are naturally what give us the best view of that composition, of that point of interest, whether it be a mountain view, a vista, waterfall. So when you put a camera in your hands in this process, you're just extending what you're already doing to find an artistic composition. Now what that means, composition literally means the arrangement of elements in a work of art, whether it be a painting or a photograph. So by looking through this viewfinder, we're able to simplify and include or exclude elements that we don't really want so that we can really focus on our subject and all of its glory. Now what I tend to do when I get to a location is walk around, I move the camera, and I almost feel like it's got a sense of magnetism or gravity. I feel like this force is kind of moving me, I'm shuffling my feet, I'm moving like, no, nah, it's a little bit better over here, and as I'm looking around, it kind of feels like I find a notch where the camera just settles into it. It's like beckoning me to raise it or lower it, and finally when I find that notch, it's like there's where I wanna be. And that's probably where I would bring my tripod over and lock off in that exact same position. One of the ways I like to uh, make an analogy for this is what I call my guest room rule. You know, when you got guests coming over and they're due to be here any minute and you haven't cleaned the guest room and you go shuffling around? Well, the rule is anything that is not useful or welcoming, I hide it. So that's what I do in composition. If it's not useful, if it's not adding anything to the scene, the composition, hide it. 
you can move the camera forward or backward to crop, or if you have a zoom lens, you can actually zoom in to a tighter focal length, which we'll talk about later, to also affect your composition. Now, some of my students in my photography class, I remember one instance, a girl brought in a photograph of a person sitting on a park bench. It was a great photograph, with the exception of it had this ugly power pole that was just on the edge of the frame coming in. And I asked her, I said, you know, um, is this photograph about this person on the park bench or is it about this ugly power pole? Because it wouldn't have taken much of a movement at all. We're talking about a tweak of going from here to here to crop that whole power pole out of the scene. Now I went out to Broken Bow to demonstrate some of the rules of composition, just like the rule of thirds. So let's go out to Broken Bow and take a little bit deeper dive into composition. Wow, what a great day to be at Broken Bow. It's gonna be a hot one, but I hope I can get through this material. I chose Crystal Point because I love the rocks in this tree, so I, I thought this would be a perfect backdrop to go through some composition, some focal length choices, and some other things. So let's get started. Now, first off, I'm gonna be shooting on a tripod just to make things simple, but we'll talk about shooting handheld as well. Now, first off, little tip. When you're setting up your tripod, always extend the big leg out first. Don't extend the skinny leg out because the skinnier it gets, the more flimsy it becomes and it can introduce camera shake. You want a nice rock solid base. However, I will mention, you can just ignore what I just said if you're out in the surf. If you're in water, especially the ocean, you want to go with that skinny leg first because that will possibly help you take this first joint of the leg up out of the water so you don't end up with sand and silt down in those joints. That just absolutely makes your tripod almost worthless. You can't even use it. So right off the bat, make sure you have a good sturdy place to put your camera and the bigger, the more beefy the tripod, the better. Now this one has two little bubble levels. It has one on the base of the tripod. It also has one on this bowl, which gives me fine tuned adjustments to make sure the camera's level. This is also a video head so that I can swivel back and forth. I can pan up and down. It keeps the camera perfectly level. And that's gonna come in really handy for our demonstration. So now let's talk about composition. This is one of the first things that beginners need to learn. Now, many people take their phones and they come to a place like this and they're just after the snapshot. You know, they just open their phone. Oh, what a pretty tree. And then they just take that shot. Now, is that the most interesting composition to be found out here? Probably not. What's worse is if they're shooting people and they put the person's face and eyes right in the center of the frame and then they've got all this room way up over their head and it just creates conflict in the composition. So how do we master composition? Well, let's talk about the rule of thirds. Now, I can take a shot of this tree the same way that I did with the phone, just dead straight on. Is that a bad shot? Probably not but could it be better? Let's see. The rule of thirds is like having a tic-tac-toe board on your screen. Now I'm gonna put this tree on the left vertical axis, and I'm gonna put the horizon on the top horizontal axis on that rule of thirds, somewhere in that region right there. I'm gonna take that shot. Now I kinda like that. Something about that feels pretty balanced to me. But what if we did the other side? Let's just flip around and put the tree on the other side. How does that look? Keeping the horizon the same. Now the tree's on the right side. Now I don't like that as much and I think I, the reason is because the sun's over there. And if we're talking about a composition having negative space or an, an area that's, that's more empty like that sky or that empty water, I tend to like to lead the eye towards the light source with that negative space. See, if the tree's on the right side, that to me creates conflict because my eye wants to know what's over there where the sun is, not necessarily what's on the other side of the tree. So for me, the first composition was actually better. But now let's try something else. What if we put the horizon on the bottom third? We're gonna keep the tree on the left and I'm gonna put that horizon on the bottom axis. Now for this particular image, I don't think I like that as much, but hang on. 
what if we had an exploding sky of interesting clouds? Maybe it's sunrise and we have all this color. Wouldn't that change that composition? I think so. So here I don't think it works because there's just nothing up there. But in that situation where there could be clouds, that could be really cool. Now let's do the opposite. Let's, uh, let's, do, let's do something uh, really extreme. Let's put the tree right in the dead center. And let's go even higher. Now I don't really care for that either, but again, if we had the clouds, it may change things. You have to just look at the situation, look at the lighting and the conditions that you have. Every element in your shot will affect your composition. On a blue sky day, you're gonna frame this tree and these rocks a little differently than if you have a cloudy day or a big storm back there, or if you have those cirrus clouds or nice little puffy cotton ball clouds. It may change things. Now lastly, as you're studying your composition, try to make sure that you keep the image as simple and clean as possible. Look for things that can become distractions. If I take my favorite composition of this tree, which is the horizon on the top third and the tree on that left vertical third, but I kind of cheat it over to the right a little bit, look what happens. I start getting a little shrub in the frame on the right side and that takes my eye directly to it because of the contrast between that little shrub and the water. And that creates a little bit of conflict. Like you want a lane going straight to that tree. You don't want to be like pinball. I used to tell my students, composition is like bowling, not like pinball. You want the eye to enter that composition and go straight to the subject. You don't want it bouncing around, going and hitting bells and going everywhere because you've got something that's distracting over on the edge of the frame. So just with a tiny tweak, I can take this camera and just turn it back to the left a little bit without really changing that interesting composition that I have and I can get rid of that little shrub. Now if you forget about it, then you're going to have to end up taking it out in post, but it's so much easier if you just work your composition while you're on the scene. So play around with your composition and try so many different shots to feel what's right. Moving your camera around is the fastest way to adjust your composition, but chances are you bought your camera with a zoom lens, which leads me to my next point and that's talking about focal length. So don't get worried about and confused about the millimeter number, just remember this. The lower the number, the wider the lens. The higher number, the tighter the lens. So a 10 mil millimeter lens or a 14 is gonna be ultra wide and show you a lot of that scene. Whereas like a 70, 100, 200 is gonna continue to zoom further and further into that scene and crop more and give you a really close up of what's way out there. Now let's talk about focal length. When you buy any beginner level camera, it's probably gonna have the equivalent of what I have here that came with this camera, and that's a 24 to 70. If you have a crop sensor or DX on an icon, you might end up with like an 18 to 55, but that's still gonna put you in this same range of a full frame sensor 24 to 70. I call this my workhorse lens because I can take that beautiful composition, that wide shot like this, or I can go into 70, and look at how much different this tree looks at 70. I may have to move back in order to use the 70, but you can also find a range in the middle if you wanna come in on that tree and make for a really full composition where the tree almost goes to the top. This is right at 35. I'm gonna take this shot. And 35, that's, that's pretty interesting right there. So, Notice as you zoom in that the background is going to continue to appear closer and closer to the subject. It's called compression. And the wider we get, the more it expands that distance and makes it feel further and further away. Those mountains right now to me don't really look that far away, but if I go to a 24, they seem further. They seem a lot further away. So let's talk about going even wider. This is a 14 to 30 which gives you just a huge view into your scene. So if I shot that same composition of this tree with it on the left vertical axis, I'm not gonna include this tree on the right. Let me show you why, because that's just distracting, right? But I'm gonna crop right about here. But notice how 
distant those mountains look now. Instead of compressing the scene, now we're expanding the scene and those mountains don't appear with my eye to be that far away, but on a 14, wow. They just seem like they're so far away from this tree. Now, I love taking a 14 to 24, 14 to 30. I love taking it off and going handheld and getting really close to the ground. I'm gonna demonstrate that real quick. Come down real low. I can articulate my screen out, get down close to these rocks, and it can really create some interest. Just take a couple quick shots here. Get down close to the water. Another thing I like about mirrorless cameras is that it's really a great step going from a camera phone. If it's touch screen, I can actually touch and tap to take the shot. It'll focus exactly where I touch and take that picture. So it's really not a huge departure from the camera phone, but it has a lot more capability. So now let's talk about telephoto. Okay, now I have a 70 to 200 telephoto. And with this lens, I'm not even going to be able to shoot this tree. But let's just take these leaves, for instance. I'm just going to shoot this branch. Now look at how close those mountains look to our scene now. Let me get on this other side and see if I can demonstrate that a little bit more. We focus on these leaves. I can even look way out there at that, that distant shore. It just brings it right up to me. If I focus on the background, look at what happens to those leaves. So a trick by using a telephoto lens, if you're really trying to shoot portraits or if you want that blurry bokeh background, it's easier with a longer lens. Even if you can't go down to a 2.8, which this one does, if you have a really long lens, you can still get a creamy background just because your subject is so far away from the background and you focus on it with telephoto, it really throws that background out of focus. So for portraits and things like uh, senior pictures or if you're taking pictures of your kids and you want that background to not distract, back up away from them, bring them away from the subject, but then zoom in on them with that telephoto lens and you can really get a creamy background. So one thing I did, I wanted to show you that similar composition with this telephoto lens. So I took this off and went handheld. I walked over there about 40 yards and shot the same angle kind of with this lens and check out how close those mountains look to the tree. Look at how it really compresses that scene. You can really accomplish some beautiful, creative looks with your telephoto lens. But you might have to walk around a little bit, but that's what this is all about. So play around with different compositions, and I know that you'll find the strongest one for your scene. So get out there and practice finding and capturing great compositions. In my next video, we're really going to get into the big three, and that's shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. But if you're a beginner, don't worry about those right now. It's okay, I'll give you a pass. You can keep it in auto mode while you're practicing composition, but soon we're going to leave that behind and get into manual mode. Now, I hope you're finding this helpful and inspiring you to get out and practice your photography, and I encourage you to do that. It's hard work to learn all of this stuff. I can't even get it out in one video. It's gonna take me multiple videos just to go through all this information. But hang in there and you will grow in leaps and bounds. Now, whatever you're looking to do better with photography, whether you wanna document your life, take pictures of your kids, your grandkids, your pets, or whether you wanna document your vacation and your travel, hang in there because it will come to you. And I think God really rewards that type of effort. It says it all through the Bible. If we work hard, God will reward that. And as you're going out and you're learning photography, it's no different. You don't even have to know the end destination, but if you put in the work, God may reveal a whole other chapter of your life that he has for you, just with photography. So guys, if you're getting value out of this video or this series, please click subscribe to my channel and share this video with your friends and give it a little like for me if you don't mind too. 
Now two things, reminders. Click the little bell so that you'll know when I go live with part two of the series. And don't forget to download my digital mobile guide. It works best if you open it up and copy it into iBooks. I have no earthly idea what that would be the equivalent of on Android because I've never been on one. But you can follow along. You can even skip ahead if you want to. But I hope that's going to be helpful for you. So good luck as you're out there practicing your compositions. And I hope that we can all get out there and explore God's creation with childlike wonder. And thanks so much for joining, and I'll see you again on the next episode.